Today we are going to read the book, Buzzing with Questions, The Inquisitive Mind of Charles Henry Turner, and it's by Janice N. Harrington and illustrated by Theodore Taylor III. You ever heard that word before, inquisitive? What's an inquisitive mind? I think I have an inquisitive mind. Do you? Somebody who likes to think, somebody who wonders things, they inquire. I don't know if I know Charles Henry Turner. All right, so this says, to my agent, Stephen Frazier, thank you. And to RDP, always. And that was from the author, Janice N. Harrington. And this says, to my son, Theo, never stop exploring. And that was by the illustrator, Theodore Taylor III. All right, let's see here. So it says, the study of biology trains the powers of observation. And Charles Henry Turner said that. It's a quote. See, so those are his words. Questions that itched like mosquito bites. Questions that tickled like spider webs. Questions you couldn't shoo away. Questions hopped through Charles Henry Turner's mind like grasshoppers. His brain buzzed with questions about plants and animals and bugs. His parents' home swarmed with books, but never enough books to answer all his questions. Charles Henry Turner asked so many questions that his teacher urged him to go and find out, and Charles did. It's interesting. I don't, I, I don't even know the time period, but it's most likely he had to go and find out by doing um, and not just by looking it up. So I think there's a difference there, too, is when you actually go and do something and experience it versus look it up and kind of find that information. And then it kind of goes out of your head really quick. That's why I always am trying to get you to do different science labs, because, um, you know, most of us really do learn by doing and having those experiences. It can help us. So we'll see if he does that, too. He read and studied and worked hard. And after he finished high school, he did what many people thought impossible. Even though he was a janitor's son, even though most colleges didn't accept African-American students, even though it meant more hard work, Charles Henry Turner went to college. So it didn't, it didn't really address that he was told to go find out, but look, I can see he is going to college and that is a huge achievement. Um, then I guess he has done the work. He has gone and explored. He has gone and found out. In his biology class, Charles met the magnetic young teacher, Clarence L. Herrick. Herrick's classes hummed with energy, students chatting, students examining the, or the organs of small animals, and students staring one-eyed through microscopes. On Friday afternoons, Herrick invited students to his laboratory for spirited talks about biology. He spread tablecloths over the long laboratory tables and set out sweet cakes and cups of tea, but Herrick worried about inviting Charles Henry Turner. And I wonder why. He worried that the other students wouldn't want to drink tea with his own only brown-skinned student. To Herrick's delight, the other students wanted Charles to join them. They liked the shy, quiet student who always earned high grades, the hard-working Charles Henry Turner. It doesn't matter what you look like, you know, we can learn from each other and um, we can all work hard, but definitely um, there were times of prejudice. I've had a lot of students ask me, what that word means. I don't know that word, Mrs. Allforce. Um, and when someone is prejudiced, it's treating someone differently just based on um, maybe how they look or maybe something that they believe or part of their life. Um, it's just treating someone wrong, you know. Um, and in a lot of our books that we've read focus on people who have 
overcome some of that, um, some of those issues where they were treated wrong uh, and they were treated unfairly because of something they couldn't help. Um, and so I think it's really important that we see that because some of us are experiencing that. Some people, some of my students are. Some of my students, I know that COVID has been so difficult for you. And this is a huge challenge. We all have different challenges. Um, and some, are, you know, are completely unfair. Like when people are prejudiced or treat somebody differently because of um, the way that they look you know, and, and that's really mostly what we focus on, but also because of um, maybe different beliefs or lifestyle choices. Um, it, people, it, when people hate just for no reason, um, other than because somebody is different. So I like to read these stories um, because I think they're very inspirational for all of us, whether this maybe is a situation you can relate to, what he's had to overcome, or if you're trying to overcome some other challenge in your life, because we all do have challenges, but it's also important to understand these challenges that a huge population of people have faced in our country. Um, and so, so if you still don't quite know what that word is, that is something I'd like you to explore. Maybe talk to your people about it too at home. All right, we're gonna keep reading. Charles was indefatigable a classmate said. He spent hours peering through microscopes, planning experiments, gathering specimens, keeping records, drawing charts, and reading scientific papers in French and in German. Different languages. But whatever the language, he never stopped asking questions. So I just looked up this word because I was not sure um, what, how exactly to pronounce that word? Look at indefatigable. You ever heard of that? I don't think I've ever heard that one before. Let's see what it means. It says incapable of being fatigued, meaning he never gets tired. He's constantly going, 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 going. Do you know somebody like that? I know I do. <laughs> what question led Charles to a small eight-legged, eight-eyed, two-fanged creature? The spider. Charles wanted to know if spiders could learn or if they were only weaving machines that made the same web over and over. Charles searched for spider webs. He trudged through meadows, inspected stone walls, and scouted the sides of railroad tracks. He toppled wood piles, lingered over logs, and peeked into dusty corners. Charles found webs, lots of them. He even spotted double webs that looked, he wrote, as if the spider were trying to fish with two lines instead of one. Hmm. That's an, a very interesting wonder, you know, if, if, you know, a spider, the spider webs are the same over and over again, or if spiders do different things. Um, but, but something that you could go and observe. Some people are like, ew, no, I would never do that. Um, but to him, that is something he would, he is interested in. I actually like looking at spider webs. I also think they're kind of fun to try to draw when you draw the lines and then you can go around. All right, let's keep going. All kinds of spiders and all kinds of webs caught Charles's attention, even a web between a windowsill and a wall. What would the spider do, Charles wondered, if he swept away its web, if, yeah, if he swept away its web. With a broom, Charles brushed away the web not knowing it was part of a science experiment, the unsuspecting spider rebuilt its web. Sweep away, rebuild. Sweep away, rebuild. After losing its web for the fifth time, the spider gave up and wove a new home beneath the windowsill. But Charles didn't give up. He repeated his experiment with an arachnarium, a spider jar. Because you guys know arachnid is a spider. Arachne arachnarium is a spider jar. He filled the bottom of the jar with sand and pushed a post into the sand. Then he added a spider. He slipped a paper triangle into the jar and watched the spider. Later, he removed the paper triangle, 
replaced it with an L-shaped tube, and watched again. With each change, the spider rewove and reshaped its web. Charles concluded that instinct told spiders to make their webs, but that each spider wove a web just right for its home. Charles called this intelligent action. Spiders were not just weaving machines. So he says that they, um, instinct told the spiders to make their webs. Um, that means something that they were not taught. That is just something that they automatically do. Just like, um, you know, we have things that we are not taught that we automatically do. Um, you know, a baby automatically cries. And over time, a baby will learn as they, they grow that that means something, like getting somebody's attention. But instinct is to cry when something is wrong right away. Um, and then it becomes, sometimes things become a learned behavior. But um, the spiders weaving their webs, he found, found out they were, that was an instinct. All right, let's keep going. Oh, the indefatigable scientist then wondered about even smaller animals. In scummy ponds and weedy ditches, he searched for tiny crustaceans. He found seed shrimp, water fleas, and wheel animals. Through his microscope, he admired their small bodies. They were beautiful and translucent, and some looked like a nest of test tubes. Charles even discovered a new crustacean and named it Cypress Herricki after his friend and teacher, Clarence L. Herrick. So he's looking at things that are microscopic. You can only see them with a microscope because they're so teeny tiny. Have you ever looked through a microscope and seen anything before? It's kind of interesting to be able to see that stuff. But Charles didn't, couldn't, wouldn't stop asking questions. At 39, he returned to school. He wanted to learn. He wanted to ask big questions about another small creature, the ants. Charles wondered how ants found their way home. Did ants have a hidden power in their brains that pulled them to their nests? Did the sun guide them? Did they follow a trail of smells? So you look at him looking at it with a magnifying glass. And so here is holding it. And so there's this eye, but you can see that ants looks so giant when it's magnified. Searching for answers over the next five years, the indefatigable scientists studied acrobat ants, big headed ants, false honey ants, and odorous house ants, all kinds of ants. To tell one ant from another, Charles marked their abdomens, those are their tummies, their abs, uh, with watercolors. He built an obstacle course with cardboard stages, cardboard rooms, and cardboard ramps. Kind of makes me want to be an ant. It's like, that looks fun, doesn't it? <laughs> ants crawled over the stages. Ants scurried over the ramps. Ants tap, tap, tap the cardboard with their antennas. Ants searched for their nests, but Charles didn't help them. Instead, he moved the ramps to unexpected places. He angled ramps up and slanted them down. He painted ramps different colors. He shifted the light and the direction of the light. He smeared stinky oils over the cardboard paths. He caused his ants trouble, trouble, trouble. But by watching ants find new ways to reach their nests, Charles learned how they solved problems. So when it says he was trouble, 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 um, <laughs> that makes me want to sing Taylor Swift, but I won't. You're welcome. Um, but he was like trying to confuse them by doing different things. Remember, he was painting the, the ramps different colors, having the light going in different directions, putting stinky oils on things. Um, but just to be able to study the ants and how they react to all of those situations. So um, how they solve those problems. So it's pretty interesting. Um, some of his ideas and some of his thinking, how he tested these things, he wondered. Charles drew a map with squiggly lines and arrows to show the wandering path of a lost ant. A French scientist called this wandering 
uh, Tournament de Tourneur, or Turner Circling, in honor of Charles Henry Turner, the scientist who taught us that ants were not mindless robots. Each ant used sight, sound, touch, smell, and the movement of its body in sunlight to find its way home. Like the ants, Charles now searched for a new home. He found work as a biology teacher at the first African-American high school west of the Mississippi, Summer High School in St. Louis. Excited by their new teacher, students filled their lab books with notes about his class. One student wrote that Charles set out dishes of jam for bees at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The bees circled and buzzed at each meal, but then Charles set out jam out jam only at breakfast, and the bees still invited themselves to lunch and dinner. Surprised, the students learned that even bees sense time. Questions kept circling and buzzing in Charles's mind. In a St. Louis park, the scientists placed red cardboard circles in a patch of clover that swarmed with bees. He coated the circles with honey, and then he waited. The bees weren't interested in his circles. They weren't even drawn to the smell of honey. But good scientists are patient, so Charles tried again. Yeah, some scientists, uh, you know, work towards something their entire lives and maybe pass away before maybe they are proven wrong or correct. Um, it's kind of crazy. So yeah, some scientists have to be patient. Sometimes you don't get the answer right away. Or sometimes you think one thing and it turns out to be wrong. Let's see what happens. He caught bees in a bottle and toppled them over the honey. At first, the bees buzzed away, but eventually they settled on the cardboard to enjoy a sip of honey. Once the bees learned that the red circles carried honey, Charles replaced the red circles with honey-filled blue circles. The bees ignored them. Whether he used circles or cones or boxes or added new colors, the bees kept flying to the color red, even when another color held lots of honey. In 32 different experiments, uh, no matter how Charles tried to trick them, the bees always chose the color red. Charles Henry Turner was the first biologist to prove scientifically that bees could see color. Doesn't that seem kind of simple? Unless you're me and I'm allergic to bees and I wouldn't want to be anywhere near that. But I feel like he's making some very simple um, experiments that he's testing and making observations on that you go, oh, yeah, I could do that. I could see if I could prove that. Now, I wouldn't advise handling bees, but um, just some of these, like, common... Um, you know, insects and, and the, the arachnids that he's using. Um, obviously, he's not hurting them, um, but he's testing how they react. You could do something like that. I bet you could be creative. Bees, giant water bugs, whirligig butt beetles, dragonfly nymphs, water striders, paper wasps, hornets, or tent caterpillars. Charles studied them all. He took cockroaches to find their way through a maze, proving that they could learn. He triggered moths to beat their wings whenever they heard a whistle, just like Pavlov, a Russian scientist who trained dogs to drool whenever they heard a bell. He frightened doodlebugs, anti-lions, and I'm sorry, anti-lions. What? <laughs> I said that wrong. He frightened doodlebugs, which are ant lions, which made them all lie still. With a magnifying glass, he studied how they moved and trapped their food. how they moved and dropped their food, how antlions grew and everything else that antlions do. Charles learned so much that he became the world's first doodlebug expert. Patiently, he watched a thousand caterpillars crawl slowly, slowly up a vertical maze, learning slowly, slowly that caterpillars find their way by trial and error. Charles Henry Turner was indefatigable. He, he never gave up. He kept going and going and going. Never seemed to get tired of that. Keeps having questions. 
His mazes, spider jars, paper circles, and cardboard stages toppled old ideas about insects. He never stopped inventing new ways to study the smallest creatures, searching for new ideas or asking new questions. Questions that itch like mosquito bites, questions that tickled like spider webs, questions that only a good experiment could show away. As hardworking as the ants and bees he studied, Charles published over 50 scientific papers on everything from bird brains and the bathroom, bathroom habits of cockroaches to blind crayfish and the growth of grape leaves. He was a pioneer scientist of animal behavior, an internationally admired entomologist. An entomologist is somebody who studies bugs or insects. And one of the leading African-American scientists of his time. But even though he was a respected scientist, Charles faced racial prejudice. He lived in the South where African Americans had to attend separate schools and where they could rarely vote. He lived in St. Louis during the terrible East St. Louis riot when hateful mobs killed more than 100 African Americans and burned their neighborhoods. Yet despite this prejudice, so remember we talked about what that word meant earlier. Yet despite that prejudice or being treated unfairly because of the way he looked, Charles wove himself into his community. He raised money for poor families and led a settlement house that sold lunches to hungry children for only a penny. He worked with white and black people to make St. Louis a better place for everybody. Biology, the study of plants and animals, gave Charles hope. He wrote that biology could help people see the connections among all living things. Biology taught us to think less about ourselves and more about others. Charles Henry Turner, the boy who never stopped asking questions, grew into the tireless reader who owned a thousand books. He was the good friend, always willing to help other scientists by offering ideas, helping with research, or sharing his equipment. If my micro camera proves a success, I shall be glad for you to use it whenever you desire. I think that's a camera that magnifies things. Charles Henry Turner, the boy who never stopped asking questions, grew into the determined biologist who would stay up all night to watch a spider or spend all day observing wasps beside a railroad track. I shall take my camera along and get a few photographs. His curiosity danced from experiment to experiment. It moved in Turner's circles in Tournament de Tourneur, always exploring, always reaching to discover new ideas. Charles Henry Turner, the boy whose teacher urged him to go and find out, grew into a teacher himself and devoted a devoted scholar who taught students to look closely, to find the webs that connect us all. And just as he did to fill the world with questions, questions, questions. And I love this, there's a quote, it says, often I have failed, my patience not being a match for the persistence of the ant. In other cases, by, pers my, by patient persistence, I have, exceed I have succeeded. And Charles Henry Turner said that. So it's just that, it, I mean, that's just him talking about how being patient and continually trying, he was able to succeed. And sometimes that is really, um, what you have to do. Um, I'm going to read the, the author's note to you. It says, when I was young, my uncles would bring me a June bug helicopter. Every summer, a rainy, shiny beetle tied to a cotton string. The June bug would fly in a circle at the end of the string. And when the June bug tired out, I untied it and let it fly away. Maybe that's why the book bug, bug, 
Bug Watching with Charles Henry Turner by Michael Elshin Ross caught my attention. As a children's librarian and an African American, I was surprised that I had never heard of Charles Henry Turner. He was a mystery and I wanted to know more. Thanks to the African American newspapers of the time, the work of scholars such as Charles I. Abramson and the libraries, archives, and historical museums in St. Louis, Kansas City, and Cincinnati, I slowly answered some of my questions. I felt drawn to Turner's indefatigable passion for learning. He studied so many topics that some scientists called him an entomologist or a zoologist, while others call him a comparative biologist or a behavioral psychologist. So basically, he studied so many different kinds of science that they, people, different people call them different names or, you know, gave them a different title. Turner also lived in my home state of Illinois, attending college in Chicago and studying a colony of wasps in Lebanon, Illinois, where he wrote after watching a wasp find its home, find its way home. How keen must be her powers of observation since she sees landmarks in a situation where we only see uniformity. Turner believed that biology helps us to see, to look at the world more closely. In these times when so many animals, insects, and plants are endangered or disappearing, what could be a more vital gift? Look at the world, ask questions, search for new answers. Charles Henry Turner said, there is so much evidence that the responses of moths to stimuli are expressions of emotion. The fact that an insect does not respond to a sound is no sign that it does not hear it. The response depends upon whether or not the sound has a life significance. There's a spider there, and we'll look at those pictures. And so um, he was born, Charles Henry Turner was born on February 3rd, 1867 in Cincinnati, Ohio. And it looks like he died in 1923 on February 14th in Chicago. And so if you would like to know more about his life, you can look some of that information up. I'm going to share that. Um, but I, I just, I love, I love the story and I love the connections that we have. I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but I feel a huge connection to, to him, to Charles Henry Turner. I'm constantly asking questions. I'm constantly exploring and trying to find out because I wonder. And I hope that my passion to do that has also made you wonder. I've seen some of my students this year who have um, created their own science labs that I didn't ask you to do because they wanted to. What are some things that you wonder about? How can you figure out those answers? I don't know. I hope to find out we're going to be doing a little lab that you get to choose to end our school year this year. So um, I want you to keep Charles Henry Turner in mind as we start this end of the year project that you have a lot of choice on. What are some things you want to know more about? So I hope you enjoyed this book. All right. That's it for me. Take care. Peace.